Welcome, I'm Barbara Stevenson. I'm the Vice Provost for Global Affairs here at UNC Chapel Hill. I see students are making your way. We, we actually have an overflow room, and my golly, we actually need one. Thank you all for coming. It is wonderful to see you all here. And we know why we're all here. It's because it's an honor and a privilege to host the United States Trade Representative, Ambassador Catherine Tai. <laughs> An important part of Ambassador Tai's work is meeting with her counterparts from other countries, but she also travels around our own country to explain the administration's trade policy and also to meet with Americans from all walks of life and hear their stories about how trade affects their day-to-day -day lives and businesses. I think she met turkeys today. <laughs> today, we're looking forward to hearing um, from Ambassador Tai about this administration's shift toward a more worker-centered trade policy. Students will have an opportunity to ask questions after our remarks and our fireside chat. And then after the Q&A, there will be pizza in the atrium. <laughs> Tonight's talk falls under the Diplomatic Discussion Series, which is an integral part of UNC's diplomacy initiative. Diplomatic discussions give Tar Heels the chance, they give them direct access to experts and practitioners who are helping to address some of the world's greatest challenges. We bring speakers to campus to discuss topics ranging from the politics of climate change in Africa, to the war in Ukraine, to the shifts in the global order. This talk is the third in a series of diplomatic discussions focused on the U.S. approach to trade. First, with FedEx founder and CEO Fred Smith last September, calling for re-engagement on multilateral trade agreements, and then in March, with Financial Times contributor and CNN contributor, Rana Faruhar, calling for economic localization. Her book is called Homecoming. Before we turn the floor over to Ambassador Tai, I think it's important to take a step back and consider the role and impact of trade in many, of our, in many facets of our lives and our work. Last spring, I co-taught UNC's Washington semester honor seminar on public policy and global affairs. Students, each interning for a nonprofit, a business, or a governmental organization, were regularly coming up against the shifting consensus on trade in the course of their work. This experience helped me realize that our students will graduate into a world and a workforce that is grappling with the breakdown of a decades-long consensus that more liberalizing trade agreements was always better. Ambassador Tai, as the nation's chief trade official, plays a central role in writing the new story, one that addresses the widely shared view among our fellow Americans that free trade agreements alone have not delivered enough for working people or fostered resilient supply chains. Students, I am thrilled to see you here tonight. This issue is highly consequential, and we need our best minds pitching in to the effort to write the new story. We're all so fortunate to hear directly from this important policy leader in the Biden administration. But let me first make a proper introduction. So who is Catherine Tai? Ambassador Catherine Tai was sworn in as the 19th United States Trade Representative on March 18, 2021. As a member of President Biden's cabinet, she is the principal trade advisor, negotiator, and spokesperson on US trade policy. Her unanimous Senate confirmation is a testament to Ambassador Tai's stellar credentials and her standout career in public service, focusing on international economic diplomacy, monitoring, and enforcement. Before joining the executive branch, Ambassador Tai worked on Capitol Hill, serving as Chief Trade Counsel and Trade Subcommittee Staff Director for the powerful House Ways and Means Committee. In this capacity, Ambassador Tai played a pivotal role in shaping U.S. trade law, negotiation strategies, and bilateral and multilateral agreements, including the recently rene renegotiated United States-Mexico-Canada agreement. Ambassador Tai is an experienced World Trade Organization litigator. 
She previously developed and tried cases for USTR, eventually becoming the chief counsel for China Trade Enforcement. I'll point out that in May of this year, it was Ambassador Tai who represented the United States in meetings with China's Commerce Minister, Wang Wintao. The first senior in-person encounter between Washington and Beijing after the China spy balloon incident. This was a critical moment in the relationship between the world's two biggest economies, one that called for all the tools and skills of diplomacy. I think President Biden knew that Ambassador Tai was just the right person for this delicate and consequential task. Ambassador Tai is highly accomplished. She earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in history from Yale and a Juris Doctor from Harvard Law School. She's fluent in Mandarin. Not only is she highly accomplished, though, she is an unusually well-loved public official. In Washington, she is spoken of with an affection that is rare. And good thing, because she has a really tough job. And I don't just mean convincing trade counterparts abroad. She also has a hard job at home. For 30 years, the Washington Foreign Policy Establishment, which I was proud to belong to, believed in and pursued with fervor a series of broadly liberalizing free trade agreements. I know I did. Getting us to see the downsides and the limitations of pursuing low cost and efficiency at the expense of every other consideration, the environment, supply chain resiliency, worker well-being, well, that has not been an easy sell. And someone less well-loved would be making far less headway. So thank you, Ambassador Tai, for accepting our invitation to visit us in, in Carolina. You're an inspiration to our students, to the whole Carolina community, and you provide us with such a wonderful example of what it means to be a global leader. Barbara, Ambassador Stevenson, thank you so much for that kind introduction, and it's great to be here with all of you today in Tar Heel country. I have to say that introduction really uh, is uh, very moving to me because um, uh, you're right, it's not easy to do uh, what it is that uh, President Biden has asked me to do, which is to, to bring a new approach to U.S. trade policy. Um, and I have to tell you, your introduction makes me feel very seen, uh, and I truly, deeply appreciate you for that. Um, let me start by acknowledging that I'm wearing the wrong colors. Um, <laughs> I, I need to buy myself a light blue colored uh, scarf, and uh, I'll know that for next time. Um, Lux Libertas, light and liberty. These are the founding principles of this historic institution. And I am here today, almost a month since the tragic shooting that happened on campus, taking the life of Professor Zijie Yan. Senseless violence continues to happen in our country, but I want to emphasize that it has no place in our country. And my thoughts and my prayers are with the professor's family and friends. But you stand strong today, more united, more dedicated, stepping forward for light and liberty, looks and uh, libertas for all, toward fulfilling your bold mission, and I quote, to lead change, to improve society, and to help solve the world's greatest problems. And we know today, we feel it, that we need change more than ever. As President Biden often says, we really are at an inflection point in history. The world that you are inheriting is complicated, and issues that are front and center now will continue to be in the world you will shape and lead. But in the midst of this great uncertainty, there is also great opportunity and hope. And the decisions that we make today will determine our future for decades to come. International trade and trade policy is no exception. For too long, our policies prioritized aggressive liberalization and tariff elimination. This approach did have benefits. We saw increases in economic activity and historic reductions in poverty in some regions. But the focus on maximizing efficiency also had significant costs and side effects. 
rising inequality and wealth concentration, good jobs lost overseas, decimating manufacturing communities, and I think that North Carolina knows a lot about that, dispersed and fragile supply chains. The status quo has not delivered the results that we need, and you, you deserve the changes that make things better and apply lessons, hard-won lessons, from past mistakes. And that is why the Biden-Harris administration has been writing this new story on trade, one with the goal of a more resilient, sustainable, and inclusive tomorrow for all of our people. We're calling this inclusive, worker-centered trade policy. A lot of people will ask me, we don't understand why you would put that series of words into uh, that combination. Please tell us more. So let me unpack what we mean by a worker-centered trade policy. First, we are committed to working with our partners and our allies. This is a key theme that you will hear from me and this administration, strengthening our cooperation with like-minded economies to build a more fair, a more sustainable future for our people, for our workers, and for our communities. One example of this is the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, or what we're calling shorthand the IPEF, our major trade initiative in Asia. The IPEF is not just any traditional trade deal. In fact, it's explicitly not a traditional trade deal. It is our vision for how countries can collaborate to deliver real economic opportunities for our people. Together with 13 other countries, we're helping smaller companies compete and thrive in the region and setting responsible standards on labor, the environment, and agriculture. Another key example of our cooperation is our work with the European Union. We settled at the beginning of this term long-standing trade disputes with the European Union so that we can focus on our shared goals and priorities. And that includes negotiations on what we are calling the Global Arrangement on Sustainable Steel and Aluminum, where the goal is to create a market between us that rewards fair trade and promotes clean manufacturing and good jobs all at the same time. That is what we envision as a race to the top, as opposed to the race to the bottom that we've seen play out now for several decades. Second, we are placing workers at the center of our trade policy by enforcing the trade rules that we have. And that's why our administration has been laser focused on holding our trading partners to account. It starts with enforcing commitments under the United States, Mexico, Canada agreement or the USMCA. This agreement, uh, which was renewed in 2020, has a brand new mechanism that allows us to bring cases against not just countries, but specific facilities that do not respect the rights of workers to freedom of association and collective bargaining. This was included when congressional Democrats renegotiated the agreement with the Trump administration to make it a better deal for our workers. And I was proud to be a part of that work when I was at the House Ways and Means Committee as Trade Subcommittee Staff Director. Over the past year, We've secured wins for workers at several different facilities in Mexico's. New collective bargaining agreements, major salary increases, safer working conditions. This is having a real impact on working people's lives. And lastly, we are incorporating more voices in our trade policy making to ensure fair and equitable outcomes. This means putting the US back into USTR. To do my job right, for us to do trade the right way, I need to hear directly from all across America, and that's why I'm here today, not just the big companies that can afford Washington lobbyists that already know what USTR is, where to find us, and how to talk to us, but workers of all backgrounds and businesses of all sizes, we need to do the work to reach out to them. And that is why I embrace the duty of meeting people where they are. As I travel across our great country and visit campuses, shops, and factories, and farms, and ranches, I am reminded that we are writing our new story on trade together. Just on this trip, I've met with a number of small business owners, and today, 
turkey farmers. I even met two turkey celebrities, the uh, pardon turkeys from last year's uh, White House ceremony. I've learned more about turkeys than I uh, had known before today. Um, and I'm happy to share. But these conversations are really important to me. Not only are we bringing more people to the table, but their voices, especially those of historically underrepresented, underserved communities, people that we never reached out to before, these voices and perspectives are helping shape our work in Washington and abroad. And I'm so honored to be a part of an administration that is fully dedicated to this vision, to use trade to deliver real results for our people, to build our economy from the middle out and from the bottom up, and to restore a fundamental fairness, opportunity, and equity so that we can all look forward to a bright future. As President Biden said at the United Nations just last week, at this inflection point in history, we are going to be judged by whether or not we live up to the promises we have made to ourselves, to each other, to the most vulnerable, and to all those who will inherit the world we create. I hope all of you, in whatever career path you choose, take part in this worthy endeavor in one way or another. Thank you so much for having me. So we cooked this up last New Year's Eve, and I'm not kidding, and we decided we would do it as mainly a fireside chat. So we've collaborated a bit on the questions, so I'm going to kick off with some questions, and then we'll go into student questions. So here we go. We're going to explore this new story. So let's start off with Bidenomics. The administration talks about Bidenomics as a new approach to reinvigorating the U.S. economy in a way that benefits benefits working, working Americans, working class Americans. So how does the trade policy fit into this overall Bidenomic story? I love, I love this question. I'm just going to make sure that you all can hear me. Um, so um, Bidenomics, and I'll just say one piece of color to share with all of you. I think that President Biden was the last person who was convinced that he should embrace the term Bidenomics because it was cooked up, I think, by very you know, skeptical and critical journalists at the Wall Street Journal and the Financial Times. Um, but uh, he has embraced it. We've all embraced it with gusto. Uh, there are three pillars to Bidenomics. The first pillar is investing in America. It's something that we really should be doing, should have been doing for a long time, and that we are doing. The second pillar, uh, educating and empowering our workers. And uh, you see this uh, focus from the administration in terms of uh, empowering our workers. In fact, I think you see an example of that today with President Biden being the first uh, president perhaps ever, but certainly in modern times, to join a picket line. Um, and then the third pillar is promoting competition. So these three pillars sounds very wonky and Washington policy. When you boil it all down, the president's vision is very simple, and that is building the American economy from the middle out and the bottom up, not from the top down. And I always get a little uh, teary-eyed and, and moved when I hear the president talk about what that means. And he'll say, we've pursued this theory of trickle-down economics for decades. And um, what we've seen is that um, We've got a lot of growth and prosperity that have uh, been created over the past many decades, but it's not trickled down very far. It tends to get captured in certain parts of our economy with certain segments of our population. And uh, not everybody is able to see that wealth at their kitchen table. So the idea is how do we harness the power of our economic policies, including our trade policies, to be expanding our middle class and to be providing a pathway for everybody who wants to join the, to the middle class to be a part of that middle class. And I think that for our trade policies, I'll just acknowledge this. Um, our trade policies sit at this very interesting intersection. We talked a little bit about this um, uh, before we came in. Um, trade policy sit th sits at the intersection of foreign policy the foreign policy team sees us as a part of their team, as a tool in their toolbox. But we're just as much a part of the domestic economic policy team. 
because everything that we do in trade, whatever the terms are that we negotiate, are going to impact some community, someone's livelihood here in America. And so what we want to make sure is that as we advance our trade policies, that our trade policies are reinforcing all three pillars, that we're investing in America. If we're investing in America, we're not bleeding out those investments through trade policy, that we're empowering our workers. And that means that we're going to be doing what we can to empower workers in other countries too, so that we can give them a fair shake at competing with our workers. And then finally, promoting competition. And this is, I think, um, one of the most radical things that we are doing which is to partner up with the enforcement agencies inside of the administration who are taking on the big corporate powers and making sure that we're not doing things in trade policy, we're not doing the bidding of those same big companies to help enrich them further. That instead, we're gonna harness the power of trade policies to create opportunities for the smalls and the mediums, for the, the, the middle out and for the bottom up. And that has required a lot of rethink. That's not been easy. You come up against the foreign policy establishment, you come up against the business establishment, but uh, I'll tell you, I think some of my most receptive audiences are uh, the younger generation of Americans. And uh, that is something that I actually am looking for all of you to affirm for me, which is um, where are your hopes and where are your anxieties? And how can we be remaking our economy, including using our tools in the trade policy toolbox to help create that bright future that all of you deserve? I was going to ask you a foreign policy question next, but I'm going to go, let's stay domestic. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, so at UNC, the diplomacy initiative, and through the diplomacy initiative, we're trying to connect Carolina with the capital, and so you're a really important part of that. They all are getting to be with, um, with, with you. And then we also take students there. So a group of students will go for four days over spring break, and they'll, maybe they'll visit USDR, yes. and they'll visit international organizations and embassies. Your work is centered in Washington and extends abroad, but you're traveling across the country and you're talking to Americans about trade. So when you go and you ask Americans how does trade affect their day-to-day -day lives, what are you hearing? What do they say? So it's interesting because there are a couple different conversations. Um, there are some people in um, uh, America who are very savvy about trade policies. Um, I think that um, uh, our workers, um, our uh, union workers in particular, are very savvy about trade policy because uh, they have felt like trade policies have hurt them for many decades. Our farmers, our farmers are really, they tend to be some of the most savvy trade policy people because they're business people. And um, we happen to be a very productive and efficient agricultural producing country. And uh, our farmers are really keyed into opportunities and barriers that we experience in our international trade. Um, but what I'd say is, um, you know, in, in reaching out to also communities and people that haven't been a traditional part of USTR's outreach, what's most important to me is trying to fill out in my mind um, who America is how diverse we are, how big we are, how regionally nuanced we are, so that when I'm in a conversation in Geneva or Brussels or Tokyo, and I'm negotiating on behalf of the United States, that my idea of the United States is filled in by all of the nuance that has come from this direct contact. And I think that at the most fundamental level, even for people who didn't really know what USTR was before I've met them, that um, what is most informative for me is just hearing people talk about their hopes and their fears. And that helps me to try to gauge the work that we need to do and um, where we need to be creating confidence in our economic relations and also opportunity. That's great. I want to talk about loss of support for those old style free trade agreements across the American public. You know, when I was ambassador to Panama, 2008, 2010 time frame, that was the, the key time for the biggest issue in the bilateral relationship was getting that signed free trade agreement actually ratified by Congress. And I first went out with President Bush. He didn't have enough support, so it didn't move. Then President Obama made a run at it, and we didn't have enough support, so it didn't really move. It did eventually. 
Then I went to London and we were very ambitious about the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership and then we ran out of steam and that died out and then the real reckoning for me came when the results of the 2016 election came in and I had to really accept in a big profound way that we in the foreign policy establishment had not brought the American people along with us on this. And it was a, I had to reflect deeply. I think it's partly why I so enjoy talking these issues over with you. When you lose the support of the people that you thought you were representing, it's time to ask what went wrong. I was really intrigued to hear the answer that you gave to Walter Isaacson, the great biographer, in your Amanpour and Company interview. We've lost support for trade agreements, but you said you talked about the potential of the populist, uh, the, the populist right and the progressive left seeing common ground in coming together around a worker-centered uh, trade policy. I wonder if you could share that concept and explore yes. it with us. No, I'd be delighted to. This is such an interesting dynamic, and it's something that uh, certainly uh, I've seen, and I've had the privilege of having a, um, a front row seat uh, and uh, uh, the opportunity to see up close, which is in trade policy, you're absolutely right for several decades. Um, the strategy we pursued was to um, build the support in the traditional center for trade. And so that was um, uh, the pro-business Democrats, the new Dems, um, uh, and also the, um, you know, the free trade Republicans. And uh, you know, there were a lot of free trade Republicans. There was a considerable amount of um, uh, pro-business, pro-trade Dems, and you could cobble together, right, uh, 218 in the House with some cushion, and um, uh, you only needed, under certain circumstances, uh, 50 to 60 in the Senate, and um, it, it was that, about that math, right? Over time, that math has gotten harder and harder and harder. Um, so that's one thing that we've seen. Uh, but certainly over the past couple years, we have seen that progressive left come together, so you know, you think about the political spectrum, it's a way that uh, we, we talk about the political spectrum. So you've got the traditional center and then you move out and the progressive left and the populist right have wrapped around and they've created a new, a second center on trade. And this is one that's really focused on reinvigorating American manufacturing, about uh, strengthening America's um, uh, uh, economic um, uh, opportunity. Um, it's about reshoring, not just friendshoring and uh, nearshoring, but reshoring. It's about resilience, uh, and it's about connecting the conversation on trade so that it's not just happening in the elite circles, but that it is connecting back to all the other, the, the middle and the bottom um, in, in our segments in our society, in those mediums and the smalls. And uh, for us, as we are uh, navigating our way to evolving a new approach to trade, placing workers at the center because they'd not been at the center before, it is all about um, touching both centers and um, uh, trying to maintain and build a broader base of support for our trade policy because we've seen what happens when we don't have that support where our trade policies become too fragile. And the one that you didn't mention was the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Yep. The one that uh, we did manage to get done in the negotiations in 2015, 2016. And uh, you know, it was so fragile, it had caused a lot of stress and tension within the Democratic Party in that last year or two. And then it was a Republican, a unique but Republican president who pulled the plug fully in the first days of his presidency in 2017. Yep. And I think that that was for us a strong signal that uh, we need to focus on building support for our trade policies because that kind of policy failure, it isn't good for us domestically, whether it's, uh, whether it's our uh, domestic producers and our uh, union workers who felt like we were selling out their livelihoods when we were negotiating this, or our farmers who felt like we had betrayed them when it fell apart, or on the foreign policy side, it, I think it was a really um, devastating hit to the partnerships with the countries who had also put in the political capital to get this thing done. Our idea is you've got to build a broad-based, trade policy in order for it to be durable 
in order for us to have sustainable economic opportunity here at home, and also in order for us to play a lasting leadership role in the world. So I really do feel like it's at the core of um, this inflection point. Uh, our ability to um, make this better, to get this right, I think will allow us to have that brightness in our future that we know that we want and that we need. So after we pulled the plug yes. on the Trans-Pacific Partnership, we just kind of hemorrhaged sway and influence in the region because we just weren't there at all. But you've gotten us back in the game with the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, yes. which is not about reducing tariffs. So it's a different kind of approach that gets us in the game, keeps us from being marginalized. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about this, this the IPEF yes. and about what it is about. Okay. I love this because I think um, it, it, it comes down to um, the vision, which is um, you know, what caused the fragility in the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, was all of the devils in the details. Um, but the overall equation, I think, still makes sense. We, the United States, should be economically engaged in cooperating and building bridges with uh, these partners in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, we should be looking for opportunities to uh, collaborate. We should be connected. Um, the issue is that our traditional model of the free trade agreement, um, most people don't know what's inside the free trade agreement. So it's sort of like, you know, here's, here's an area where we should be economically engaged. Go do the FTA. And I think that the problem is that the, the traditional FTA was all about liberalization. Take down the tariffs, um, take down regulatory barriers, uh, try to chill um, regulatory uh, activity by other countries, and just let the capital flow wherever it goes. And we saw that once you let the capital decision makers uh, free, they're just going to chase the lowest cost. And that creates that uh, race to the bottom. So um, for us, what we've said is, look, we're not sworn off of liberalization. Liberalization could very well make sense. Just probably we need a new way to do it. And we also need to recognize that um, I think we pursued liberalization for liberalization's sake because we equated liberalization with this almost religious faith that the more we traded with the more people, the more peaceful and prosperous the world would be. And I think that we've also come up against a reality that uh, we're in a pretty globalized world and um, there is a land war in Europe again, right? So. Um, we identified three, what we think are higher goals, certainly for this phase of our economic history, which is not liberalization for liberalization's sake, but what are all the trade tools that we can harness to serve the purposes of resilience, sustainability, and inclusiveness? And those are the three things that we really feel like we need. And let me tell you, in my conversations with my counterparts in the Indo-Pacific and frankly all around the world, we are all anxious about how unresilient our economies have been in our supply chains, how unsustainable the future feels. I mean, it, it, the business sector also, I think that they're actually a bit, uh, quite ahead of at least us in government. You know that you need a runway for the future, for economic prosperity and hope, the runway feels short and getting shorter. And then on inclusivity, I think here at home, that widening inequality, that sense of economic insecurity, I think that you know the American dream is something that we all believe in profoundly. The American dream feels very fragile today. Um, and uh, if you look at it internationally also, I think that um, since we have gone through COVID, what we've seen is both here at home, not all communities were exposed to the dangers and the risks of COVID in the same way. And I think not all sectors of our economy. So I think that you know restaurants, movie theaters, um, uh, the tourism industry, turkey farmers, um, all got really hit hard. Yeah, food distribution got hit very hard during COVID. Um, some industries, uh, and I'll be polite for now and not name them, some industries did even better with COVID than if there had not been COVID. And I think that when you, when you scale that back out and you look around the world, you realize that that's true for entire economies. 
that some economies that were really struggling were in danger of being left even further behind. So there is this moment that is really profoundly important where we desperately need new ideas. And so the Indo-Pacific economic framework is something that is new. It's a bit hard to explain because we're doing things that don't fit a template that we've done before, but I think it is really important. You know, I love it because, of course, as a former diplomat, I just think that America's unrivaled network of alliances and partnerships is the foundation of our leadership role. And when we stopped talking about trade, we walked what we were giving up a really important part of leveraging access to the world's largest economy. We were just letting it lie fallow. And you're working it again. And what I understand, there's like four different pillars. Okay. You can kind of opt in in an a la carte way mm -hmm. to what you want to talk about, mm -hmm. unlike a comprehensive free trade agreement where you had to take every chapter. So it feels more flexible. Yes. And what I understand is the 13 countries that are involved in this are stepping up to talk and talk and talk. They are, they are, they are, and in certain areas they're more willing than others. Um, yeah. But you know, something else, because it's a, it's a really interesting 14-country uh, group. There are six advanced economies. There are eight developing economies. Yep. Among the developing economies, um, they range from India, which is enormous, now I think the most populous nation in the world, to Fiji, where your Fiji water comes from, by the way, uh, <laughs> which is tiny, 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 a little island nation, and really existentially grappling with what happens when sea and ocean levels rise, how they're going to continue to exist. And um, they're really interesting conversations, but we spend a lot of time talking about capacity building, yeah. right? How the advanced economies can partner with the developing, how we can find new ways of partnering. And I think that um, the way that we are doing the discussions and the negotiations is also capacity building for the relationships and the partnership. So um, I, it, we've only been at it for a little over a year. Um, but uh, it's a forum that we hope and that we are designing to be enduring. I know. Watch this space. There was so much sneering when you first launched it, and I know the sneering is kind of subsiding. It's just maybe not quite. Maybe where you not sit. all the way. Not but all yes, the way. I think it's gotten better. <laughs> okay. I want to go back to what's wrong with the old way that we did this. And in that same terrific Walter Isaacson um, interview, you described traditional free trade agreements as designed to be leaky. And you noted that they create real benefits for free riders. And so I know this is a little bit of a technical topic, but I think you can't understand why you need to rethink trade agreements without having some kind of an understanding about what does it mean that these agreements were designed to be leaky, and how has that played out over time, and can we fix this? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is great. So um, this is where I take great pride in um, saying I'm a trade policy person. I'm not a tax policy person. Um, because uh, anyway, tax is, uh, is more geeky, more wonky, uh, and more complicated. But this leakiness issue does require you to dig into the trade policy a bit to understand the guts of a trade agreement on the tariff liberalization and how it works. So a lot of people think that, well, you know, um, an FTA, a traditional FTA is a gift that you bestow upon um, a partner. And, uh, you know, it means that you're going to tie your economies together and it's gonna be this really great relationship. And um, very few people actually understand how the rules work. And on the tariffs, what happens is um, the goal of a trade uh, agreement, the way that we have traditionally negotiated them, is to take down all tariffs between your two countries, um, which means um, really exposing your economies to each other. Um, now, how does that work, right? Because uh, if I show up at the border and I have a good that is quite complex to make, let's say a car, and I say, great, uh, this car is coming from me and it is going over the border to you, don't assess tariffs. There is actually a quite complicated accounting uh, and uh, technical exercise that has to happen. And the questions that we're going to ask are, in order to qualify for this tariff preference of not paying a tariff at all, you need to prove to us that this thing that you're trading uh, was made with products from your economy and or my economy. Now, the issue is in a car, there could be thousands of parts. 
So does all of it have to come from our two countries? Well, that's a really high bar, and not everybody makes everything. So you set what's called a rule of origin uh, for how much of that good has to come from the economies in the agreement to qualify for the tariff preference. And uh, that number can be quite low. So one of the uh, controversies in the Trans-Pacific Partnership was for the autos rule of origin. And remember, there were 12 countries there. Um, the rule of origin was maybe around 30%. Now, it's hard to tell is that high or is that low, but just have in the back of your mind that the NAFTA countries, the North American countries, and now the USMCA, um, we have a pretty integrated supply chain. In order to make a car here, parts move across those borders multiple times. Um, the rule of origin is around 65%. And so the concern there is, well, if you lower that rule for an automobile to 30%, that means 70% of that car and its components can come from other places. And uh, those other places um, don't have to be a party to this agreement. And those countries haven't made any concessions as part of this negotiation. And so that's the leakiness. They're designed to be leaky, and we haven't been that um, uh, uh, picky about it because our whole multilateral trading system is weighted heavily in favor of liberalization, in favor of this um, faith that the more trade there is, the better off we all will be. And again, I think that just in these last couple years, the backlash against globalization, the pandemic, the supply chain discombobulations, um, uh, the war, uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, spiking in security in terms of food, spiking prices in terms of energy, are making all of us sit back and go, wait a minute, I think that there is a better way to do this. And um, that is what I've been asking my team to do every single day, which is don't give up on trade. We've got some really important and powerful tools. Figure out how to use the tools that we have differently to get different results. And then figure out, if we need new tools, go back to Congress. Most of our trade toolbox was created in 1970, 1988. There was a big influx in the early 2000s. We need new tools also. So that's part of the innovation we're pressing ourselves to do. You probably don't want me to ask this, and you can dodge it, because you're very skillful at that. I watch your interviews. But you did talk about there are free riders, yeah. and this constant, the benefits of these leaky rules of origin have yeah. really concentrated, and yeah. it's part of the issue. Do you want to talk about that at all? Yes, and uh, I think that um, uh, you're being very skillful as well. Um, <laughs> the question is, what about China? What about China? Right? What yeah. about China? Yeah now is the primary trading partner of two-thirds of the countries in the world. Most yes. of them trade twice as much with China as with the U.S., yep. a dramatic transformation since 2001 yep. when 80% of all the countries in the world traded primarily with the United States. Yes. Okay. Leaky rules of origin. Yes. Well, um, you know, if you want to take the, um, the benchmark as 2001, uh, the Chinese economy has, since their entry into the WTO, um, has massively transformed, right? Um, I'll take it back a further 10 years. Uh, the first trip I ever took to China was uh, summer after my junior year of high school. Uh, and we were gonna do it in 1989, which is the summer after my freshman year, but something happened in China in the summer of 1989, which was the Tiananmen Massacre. So uh, that trip was called off, and we stood it back up two years later. Uh, and the streets of Beijing were still filled with bicycles, like massive boulevards, rows of bicycles. Um, I got on a bicycle. There's a whole, um, anyway, um, I fell off my bicycle. I'm, anyway, I'm not a bike rider, and it's largely because of that experience. But um, <laughs> uh, there's um, a fascinating, just incredible sense of potential, really, really long history. Um, so uh, the last time, well, 2011, I went to China as a USTR official, a lawyer, as part of the Joint Commission on Commerce and Trade, one of our dialogues. So that was 20 years after I'd, I'd first gone. And uh, we were in uh, Chengdu, and uh, we were staying at a big fancy hotel. 
And I was standing there waiting to cross the street. Again, really wide boulevards, a lot of people who live there. And I saw a gold-plated Bentley drive down. <laughs> and I've never seen one. I'm sure they're here in the United States. I've never seen one. Saw one there, and my jaw just dropped open. And that was just over 20 years, right? So that was 12, 13 years ago. Just the pace of change. So first, I want to say um, the Chinese have done something incredible. Um, there's been so much change, but over time what we found is that um, there are a lot of ways in which our economies are just not aligning. That their economy has evolved out of a socialist communist system, and it still bears the heavy influence and direction from the state. Here in the United States, we have a market-based economy where um, that separation of church and state is, is found in our economy and the separation between state and economy. I mean, that's the idea, right? There's the private sector, there's the public sector, there's a little bit of gray area, but you know, never the twain really should meet. Um, so uh, this is kind of a, a bit of a wind up to acknowledging that um, uh, China's footprint in the global economy is enormous. They are the second largest economy in the world. We are the first largest economy in the world. The fact that we are not aligning means that um, there's a lot of tension in the system. So uh, as we are thinking about creating more resilient supply chains, creating more resilient economy, I think you know maybe the most um, concrete example I can give is if everybody just thinks back um, a little over three years ago to the early days of the pandemic. Yeah, when we all needed masks. And it's not a high-tech product, it's simple. And uh, everybody in the world needed the same thing at the same time. Uh, but almost all of it was being made in only one place in the world. And that was the place that had gone into lockdown first. And that's when we started to realize, whoa, um, our supply chains are really concentrated. Production is concentrated, and why? And it's because we kept throwing open the world, lowering barriers and saying, hey, producers, um, chase efficiency and they chased the lowest cost. China became very good at making things, and lots of things we found were only being produced in China. And um, the risk that that has created for us, right? So, you know, I'll, I'll put it in another term also because I don't know, um, sometimes this frame of reference is helpful. Um, we in the Biden administration are uh, pushing this um, awareness around the need for more competition and more opportunity in our economy, and that means going after the bigs, the bigs that are dominating the market. Um, so for example, um, I'm gonna pick on them because the FTC in 17 states went after them today. Uh, Amazon, right? And uh, Amazon is basically everywhere, uh, but if you just look at Amazon as a bookseller, uh, Amazon, I think, has actually never made money selling books, and yet, uh, the number of independent bookstores in our communities has really shrunk over the last 20, 30 years because of that dominance, right? Um, I think that we also have that challenge with China as an economy, that that kind of concentration and consolidation in the global economy is also putting pressure on economic opportunity in markets like ours. So um, with respect to the way that we have done big liberalizing free trade agreements. That is part of the reason why we're not doing tariff liberalization with anybody right now, because we need to come up with a way to do trade agreements where we're actually creating more diversity and more options outside of China, uh, and not further tying ourselves to uh, supply chains that run through China. And in a way, you know, I want to take a couple steps back because I also want to be careful about not adding fuel to a very, very hot fire in terms of the rhetoric and the tension between our countries and economies. Our ability to diversify and create more options in the global economy, I am hopeful, will also help to take the temperature down. When you feel like your back is up against the wall and the other side, if they decide that they are upset with you, can basically choke off your access to uh, raw materials, uh, face masks, um, or on our side, uh, semiconductors, um, you're going to be a lot more jumpy and anxious than if you have the confidence to know, I have more options and there's more cushion in the global economy. So um, that's, that's what we're trying to do. 
That's really interesting. I'm going to do one more, and then we're going to turn to student questions. But you, you referred kind of fleetingly to these, these the, the basic free trade agreement. You know, it, it's, it's, it's dated. You know, it's 80s and 90s. And in a hearing before the House Ways and Com uh, Means Committee earlier this year, you highlighted the need to update global rules around digital trade. And how does digital trade fit into the Biden administration's fresh approach to international trade? And what's guiding your approach? Great. So the digital conversation is um, really important and also really challenging um, because uh, digital trade um, is different from our traditional goods trade, like when a car comes across the border or, you know, um, uh, those are things that you can uh, see and feel and touch. Uh, digital is really about um, uh, the data and, I mean, the cloud. I don't know. How, the, Anyway, things that you things things that you you don't see and feel and touch, and yet are driving our economy, are part of the the economic infrastructure, right? So one of my realizations coming in to this job and realizing, oh my God, we got to grapple with the digital economy is the digital economy is the economy. There's no there's no borderline between where the regular economy ends and the digital economy begins, right? And uh, we were also thinking about what does a worker centered digital trade policy mean? And so, you know, some people were saying, well, you know, they're workers in the digital economy. They're the people who work for the digital companies. And I was like, well, that feels a little narrow because um, in the working world, um, oh, we're using digital tools. I mean, um, you know, uh, even here um, among uh, academia and students and professors, Right, the cloud, uh, Google Docs, the, the way you learn and collaborate is largely now digitally enabled. So um, one of our recognitions is that um, when you are dealing with digital, uh, you're dealing with a lot more than just trade. And so when I think about our role at USTR on digital trade, I'm going to think really big, and this is going to sound a little abstract, but uh, I hope that you'll get it, which is um, our role is to conduct our trade policy with respect to um, digital, the digital reality in our economy, with respect to our technology companies uh, in a way that supports not just the three pillars of Bidenomics, but our democracy. And I think that that's profound because I think that um, the digital reality that we live in is also putting incredibly interesting and challenging pressures on our democracy itself. And so that means that as important and necessary as it is for us to engage on digital trade right now, I am going to be super scrutinizing about how we negotiate digital trade to make sure that I'm not just carrying the interests of our biggest technology companies, but I'm really pressing ourselves to think about whose equities are we negotiating on behalf of the workers, the people, the environment, and also our democracy. We've got our dean of uh, the School of Data Science and Society, so we'll be continuing this over dinner. Now, though, first of all, how about a round of applause for Ambassador Pye? <laughs> So we're going to turn to audience questions now. And we have mics set up in both aisles. And the first people I want to call forward are um, students in Dr. Kevin Fogg's uh, History 134, Modern East Asia. They've prepared some questions. So Susie Fing, John Davenport, and Rariko Kubota, can you come on forward to the mic? We're going to start with these three students. And then I'll ask others of you who've got questions to do exactly what you're doing, line up. That way we know you've got questions. So let me start with Susie. Hello, Ambassador. Oh. Hello? It's on? Uh, um, in your first speech as United States Trade Representative, you stated that the economic competition of trade between countries incentivizes, quote, downward pressure on economic protect, oh, environmental protection, sorry, end quote. But also that it doesn't have to be this way and listed some ways that the US has tried to uphold greener trade policies. 
However, fighting climate change requires an international effort, as we've seen concerning weather patterns affect countries around the globe. You've touched on this a bit already today, um, but could you elaborate on measures taken since your speech in 2021 to coordinate and enforce international cooperation with greener trade and manufacturing policies? Yes, I'd be delighted to. So I think that your question really sets me up to highlight one of our initiatives, um, uh, which is the uh, global arrangement on sustainable steel and aluminum. So um, if you may recall, in 2018, the Trump administration imposed global tariffs, so that's tariffs on everybody, uh, on uh, steel and aluminum coming into the United States. And um, this was an example where I think uh, championing the interests of uh, American national security, certainly, but also our steel producers, aluminum producers, and our workers in those industries um, uh, really was done in a way that um, uh, uh, inflamed our um, uh, alliances and relationships. So uh, part of what we did coming in was we started with the Europeans and said, hey, you know, um, in response to those tariffs, they applied retaliatory tariffs on a lot of our foodstuffs uh, and our um, uh, whiskey and bourbon. And, uh, you know, let's, let's take the temperature down and let's try to negotiate something where, you know, your steel and aluminum producers are also being affected negatively by this global overcapacity and overproduction, driving down prices, driving our producers out of the market. Um, let's work together. So the concept of what we've been negotiating is, hey, let's take the US and the EU markets. Let's uh, negotiate where we can put our markets together. And we can have um, as much um, uh, fric frictionless trade as we, we can, but it's out of a recognition that um, both of our producers are maintaining a fairly high level of clean production and that uh, our markets uh, are um, producing based on market demand and we're not overstimulating production in our markets. And uh, let's find a way to do this so that around our markets we create two filters. One of them for uh, clean production and clean trade. The more cleanly you can produce and trade your steel and aluminum, the more you meet our standards, uh, the more we treat you like us and you have easier access into our market. And at the same time, we'll ask the question, the more fairly you're producing, the more market-based your production, the easier access you'll have in too. And the logic behind this is by combining our markets, instead of incentivizing cost cutting, lower standards, we're actually using our market power to demand higher standards, both on fair trade and clean trade. So that's an example of um, the vision that we are driving towards. I just wanna say one more thing on climate and trade. Um, I think that, is, especially with my partners in Congress, they really like to talk about, uh, and, and the foreign policy establishment, they like to talk about American leadership Right, that America needs to lead, and um, you know we shouldn't we shouldn't fall behind in the competition. One of the issues is, and I want to be really honest about this on climate, on climate and trade. I can't lead. I can't lead because America doesn't have a broad base of bipartisan support around climate policy, and until we do. I don't have the tools to engage with the other countries that we need to, to work on solutions. And I think that goes also a bit for digital in terms of privacy policy, in terms of liability policy. Until the United States is able to articulate our own policies in this area, I got nothing to bring to the table in the international conversation because I'm just a trade negotiator. If I do something through our trade policies that either forces domestic action at home or that makes our domestic political actors feel like I'm tying their hands, that's the end of our trade policy and that's the end of my job. <laughs> so, you know, I know that, I know that climate policy is changing in large part because both parties know that they have to have a vision, they have to be accountable to the next generation of Americans. And so, not to put even more pressure on you, but maybe to, to lift you up and say, you are going to be the reason why we will be able to lead. But as of today, I have very few tools. And um, it, it really is, um, it really does hamper uh, that international conversation. Thank you. Question. Where is John? 
John, please go ahead with your question. John Davenport. Uh, thanks for coming, uh, Ambassador. I, uh, okay, <laughs> sorry. Thanks for coming. I appreciate you being here. Uh, my question is regarding Taiwan. Um, with Taiwan being the largest exporter of semiconductors through their company TSM, as well as being a large point of contention between the United States and China, do you see a way forward where the United States has become more semiconductor independent or sources them elsewhere? Also, how might the even further dependence on China affect our economy and the global order? Thank okay, you. Great. Okay. So on uh, semiconductor chips, um, my answer for you takes us back to um, pillar one of Bidenomics, which is invest in America. Uh, on a bipartisan basis, um, in the first two years of this term, uh, President Biden uh, worked with the Congress and uh, managed to get bipartisan legislation passed, the Chips and Science Act. And the Chips and Science Act brings with it uh, incentives and support for the United States to reestablish uh, its, uh, its leading edge uh, position, not just in research and design for chips, but also in manufacturing. And so uh, if you follow the news on, and I think that we have a website, an Investing in America website, and you look at semiconductor fabs that are going up in lots of different parts of the United States, you will see an enormous amount of investment uh, that is going on right now precisely to address this particular supply chain vulnerability. Um, your second question was about China and reliance on China. Is that right? Um, again, I think um, on this one, there are lots of in and outs on the technical aspects, decoupling versus de-risking, neither of which is a term that we came up with. Um, but I think it goes to um, an important policy conversation around um, how we can find a way where we can coexist constructively and productively with these two massive but very differently structured economies, and that's definitely a part of the question. Thank you, John. Uh, Rorika? Um, thank you so much for providing us with a, such a good opportunity. So my question is, what factors enable you to work independently and with strong influence within the administration. Okay, that's wonderful because uh, it allows me to talk a little bit about how USTR is structured. I'm gonna tell a little bit of an origin story. I'll try to keep it short. Um, but uh, since Amb uh, Ambassador Stevenson um, uh, grew up in the State Department, um, USTR, you heard I'm the 19th US Trade Representative. Sometimes I'm introduced along with the Secretary of Health and Ser Human Services, and he's like the 75th. Um, and, and that just goes to the fact that USTR was only created in 1962. We just had our 60th birthday. We used to be a part of the State Department. Uh, you know, the State Department used to do the trade negotiations and the trade policy. And it was around 1962 that the Congress had enough. In fact, there's this great, that's right, that's right, that's right. There's this great speech by an Alaska senator, and I, um, I got to go back and find his exact words because he's really um, uh, eloquent about it and, and angry. And he said, I'm so tired of having the livelihoods of my fishermen traded away because we're trying to make friends with some other country far, far away. We need a bunch of uh, scrappy, scrappy and irritating people. Uh, we need for those people to be located inside of the White House. We're part of the executive office of the president. And we need for those people to be maximally sensitive and sensitized to the needs of the Congress. And for us, that's the Ways and Means Committee and the Senate Finance Committee. Um, and uh, they have to then chart the path and navigate between the foreign policy considerations and the domestic economic equity. So we were born to sit inside of this important intersection between foreign policy, domestic economic policy, but also between the executive branch and the legislative branch. So to your question, um, are we really independent? We're not, compared to some of our sister agencies. Like the Department of Justice is independent. As you heard um, Attorney General Garland say, uh, last week at a hearing, I am not the president's lawyer and I am not Congress's prosecutor. At the end of the day, I am both the negotiator, my, my boss is the president, but I've got, I've got 535 bosses in the Congress too that I'm accountable to. So, um, you know, uh, 
uh, how then are you able to have influence? And I think that you know we're very proud at USTR. We're small. We're 300 people full force. Um, compared to the State Department and some of the, these agencies that are enormous, uh, tens if not hundreds of thousands of employees, um, we're small, we're lean, we're mean, and we're mighty. <laughs> and uh, we exercise our influence by being really good at those things that we were created to do. The State Department has about eight or 9,000 uh, diplomats, so it is considerably larger, although think about Department of Defense, like 1.2 mil I mean, million. They really, actually, yes. they, they just dwarf everything. Indeed. So there we are. Indeed. There we are on the agency things. All right, now it's open mic, so I'm going to go to this side for a question. Uh, hi, Ambassador Tai. Uh, my name is Ezio Wan. I'm a second year uh, PhD student at UNC Chapel Hill studying international relations. Uh, I'm actually from Beijing, China, and I'm still a Chinese citizen, so full disclosure, I'm not really American. Um, but first of all, I just would like to thank you for um, the uh, point you made about U.S.-China relations and, and trade, uh, trade with it, because uh, frankly, to be honest, the temperature uh, in this room when it comes to U.S.-China relations has been quite moderate, and this has been one of the most temporary discussions I think I've been in in a while when it comes to uh, U.S.-China relations, so thank you for that. And, um, uh, my substantive questions, I have two substantive questions. The first is related to the 301 tariffs. Um, Secretary Raimondo, Commerce Secretary Raimondo made a visit to China a few weeks ago, and um, between the lines, she hinted that the U.S. was open to promote trade that is not related to national security. I think I was in her opening speech with uh, Commerce Secretary uh, Wang Wentao. Uh, so my question is, uh, judging from the reading between the lines of those meetings in general, uh, my question is, is there, are we seeing a window of opportunity where both, st uh, both sides may consider communicate on this issue and take a step back? Not necessarily canceling the whole thing, but just leave, open up more breathing room on this issue for both sides. Uh, my second question is related to partisan the role of partisanship in, uh, and uh, bureaucracy. Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, I think U.S. Undersecretary Colin Cowell was at Duke, and he made he shared with us an experience he had to go through in the congressional confirmation, where he was questioned uh, uh, severely for his uh, partisanship issue. Do you see how do you see partisanship impact your work as a professional bureaucrat? And do you see uh, should professional bureaucrats like trade represent like a trade representative be involved with party politics in party politics in any capacity? Mm. Thank you. Okay. So you asked two questions, and they were um, very substantive, so I'm just going to try to remind myself. The first question was on uh, uh, tariffs, national security, and a window of opportunity. I'm going to unpack that a little bit. Uh, we just talked about um, uh, the um, scramble for PPE um, three years ago and just surgical masks, um, N95 masks. Um, are those national security products? In that moment, I would argue, yes, they were public health critical. One of the issues that I have with this kind of, well, this is a national security product and this one isn't, is where do you draw the line? So I think that um, you know, that frame, I think, is a very um, practical one. But if you're going to implement it, where do you draw the lines? And I think North Carolina in particular, which still produces textiles against all odds, because I think that normally, you know, according to the logic of globalization, you're not a low-cost labor country. Um, uh, you have high environmental standards. Why are you still in the business of making textiles? It matters, yes, because our textile makers that were still in the business of making underwear, t-shirts, um, uh, socks, they were the ones who had the know-how to pivot and to eventually start making PPE and masks here. So that's just, I just wanted to unpack that piece. Whether or not there's a window of opportunity, um, I think that what you see from our administration over the course of this year, trip by Secretary Blinken that was delayed for four months because of this balloon incident, uh, trip by Secretary of the Treasury Yellen, um, Special Envoy Kerry, Secretary Raimondo, we are still in the business of rebuilding the infrastructure of um, bilateral intergovernmental communication. And for me, um, I have had a chance to meet um, uh, Minister Wang 
Uh, I am very much looking forward to having the opportunity to meet with the new Vice Premier, um, uh, He Lifeng, uh, responsible for uh, US-China trade and economic issues. Um, but uh, the conversation that I am most interested in seeing and the, the, um, the reestablishment of the channel is between our defense ministers. Uh, and so when we are at this stage, it's hard for me to imagine that there's a huge window of opportunity for more advanced discussions, but I think that it is important for us to be building towards that. On partisanship, um, just to be clear, mine is a political position. Um, I'm unusual in being a technocrat in this position. Um, I think that it is actually important to have uh, people in these positions who are dialed into the political conversation. I'm actually much more hopeful about the trade conversation in, in, in terms of the partisanship because um, I have friends and allies on both sides of the aisle. Uh, I have friends and allies in unusual places and it gives me hope that we have a path to establishing bipartisan policies here um, where you least expect it. That's great, thank, thank you. you. Let's take a question from this side. Hey, um, first thing, thank you so much for coming. My name is Mark Thomas Patterson. I'm a history PhD student here at UNC. My question's about agriculture, the previous liberalizing consensus, and US trade policy. As a diplomatic historian, I know that U.S. agricultural producers have been longtime supporters of liberal trade policy, and recently there's been a shift towards a more, I won't necessarily say conservative approach, but looking especially at worker well-being, as you so eloquently put it, especially given the differences between many agricultural producers in the Biden administration on polarization lines and partisan lines. How have you felt it like going and talking to these people, how are they, re especially agricultural producers, reacting to this yeah. new trade order? Yeah, great, okay. So farmers are a critical um, element of my coalition. Uh, they're part of the traditional center. Um, we've actually taken much better care of our farmers in our uh, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years of trade policy than we have our industrial producers. Rules of origin, again, um, you know, maybe shorter supply chains because they're more basic products. Um, uh, you know, um, let's say a can of condensed milk versus an entire car. Um, but uh, we have been very strategic about um, how we've engaged in trade for our farmers. So um, they're also uh, uh, really um, uh, productive um, uh, members of our economy. And they are uh, so productive, we produce, in most things, more than we can consume. And so they are looking for export opportunities. Um, the pitch that I've been making to our farmers, and I've got a great partner in um, Tom Vilsack, our Ag Secretary, on this, which is um, uh, we are still looking out for you. In fact, uh, a trade policy that works for America has to work for as much of America as possible. We can't say, just because you've been a winner, that now we're going to make you a loser. You might not win as much out of the policies that we're advancing now than the comprehensive trade policies, but we're also not going to be pitting you against our industrial producers. Um, so uh, one of the reasons why I spent so much time with the turkey farmers and the turkeys today is because we just uh, secured a deal with India as part of a deal to uh, bury the hatchet on seven outstanding WTO disputes that we had between us, some of which were years long. Uh, India agreed to take down quite high tariffs on a number of agricultural products, including their turkey tariff. Uh, they're not a huge uh, existing market for turkey, but turkeys, turkeys are a great source of protein. <laughs> And uh, we are really, really delighted to be creating this opportunity for our turkey farmers to access a new market and creating the opportunity for the people of India to uh, experience a new product. And I think that you know, that's the approach that we're taking, which is, um, as my chief ag negotiator says, we're no longer trying to um, uh, uh, make the, um, uh, Shoot, what's that thing in baseball where you, anyway, you, grand the Grand Slam, thank you. <laughs> Gosh, I really got to bone up on my sports. We're no longer aiming to, to have that Grand Slam every time, but we are studiously 
hitting those, um, those plays, the singles and the doubles, and trying to rack up our wins that way, and trying to bring along the entire economy with us. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, uh, Representative Thai, for being here today. I'm a freshman, and my name is Woodford Ragland. My question is, uh, as the first Asian American to serve uh, in your position, how has uh, your identity in, uh, influenced your, your perspective on international trade, and how it, uh, has it uh, influenced your relationships with uh, East Asian trade partners? Yeah, great, great question. So, um, you know, uh, I was talking to um, a group of uh, Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, um, state um, uh, political leaders here in North Carolina earlier today, and uh, acknowledging that um, being an Asian American member of the cabinet, um, I'm, I, you know, I am uh, part of a cabinet that looks like America. My job also, in addition to being trade rep, is to be a representative of the community in the administration and from the administration to the community. And one of the big challenges that I think that we have for Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islanders here is um, continuing to struggle to make strides uh, to achieve belonging in this country, in this society. And how many times has someone like me had the conversation with someone about, well, where are you from? I'll say, well, you know, I was born in Connecticut. I was raised in uh, the suburbs of DC. Oh, yeah, but where are you really from? Well, you know, it doesn't really matter because um, I'm an American. And so uh, being the first Asian American to have this job, to have the title of United States Trade Representative means that wherever I go in the United States and outside in the rest of the world, it's in my title. I am here to represent the interests of the United States, the entire United States, in these trade policy, trade negotiations. Um, I think um, uh, that's an incredible uh, honor and privilege. It's also um, a huge responsibility. When I show up in Asia, uh, I will say, I think that probably I am um, more recognized there than I am in many places here in the United States. And uh, um, uh, uh, I think especially women in Asia, would we'll just show up and um, you'll, I'll put it this way. When I was in college, I, I'm not that tall. I had a friend who's six feet, six inches tall. And he told me, you know, when tall people see each other in a crowded room, they look at each other and they, they recognize each other. Like, <laughs> you're tall, I'm tall. We know what it's like to be tall. Uh, I have, I, I, I still don't really believe him, but I have that experience. I have that experience, especially with women in Asia, where you just look at your, each other and you go, I'm a woman, you're a woman, we're Asian. Um, there's a certain set of experiences that you can kind of assume. Um, and I think it's really interesting. And I think that for, um, you know, I'm not formally, a, I guess maybe I am formally a part of the diplomatic corps, but uh, to represent the United States and to be able to connect with people in the rest of the world in that particular way, I think that um, it is going to be a part of American leadership to be able to build more bridges with more different countries in the world, and I'm really, really proud to be a part of that. That was such a great answer. And Emmy Grace has given me the it's time, and we're not going to end on a better note. That was absolutely fabulous. Oh, Students, your you. questions were brilliant. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them. We can uh, write them down, and I'll send them to them. <laughs> can we have a round of applause to thank Ambassador Tosh? <laughs>